है Hello everyone, welcome to the OPS Aerial and OPS AWG meeting. And please note this session is being recorded. Next slide. Uh, note well, please make sure you understand those important legal issues. Basically, all your uh, video, audio, uh, presentation, draft need to follow the ITF rules. Next. And here are some meeting tips. Uh, please make sure to sign into the session using the mid echo and please mute yourself uh, if you are not talking. And here are some resources for ITF 117 and you can see the agenda, the mid echo and you can report issues. Uh, so we come to the first session. Welcome to uh, OPS AWG. It's chaired by Tian Ran, Joe and Hank. And before we can really start, we need a job subscriber and a minutes taker. Is there any volunteer? Come on. <laughs> no? That sounds like it. <laughs> so the jumper? Okay. I jabber, I'll and Hank, if you can watch Jabber. Yeah. Okay, okay. Let's go ahead. Next. So here is the working group status. Uh, since last meeting, we published the four RFCs quite a lot. And congratulations to the authors and the contributors. You didn't uh, raise your hand. Yeah, I'm not logged in yet. So <laughs> uh, I just say, yes, I'll take notes. I'm happy to do that. If other people contribute as well, that really helps me because I'm also trying to pay attention to what, I'll, what everyone else is saying at the same time. So if someone can help, that'd be great. Thank you. So we, we use HedgeDoc to take, to take notes. So you don't have to note down what's on the slides. You just have to note down the conversation. Um, so if you could go to that link and if you just put stuff in, it does help right. us and Rob. So thank you. Okay. And in addition to the RFCs, uh, we have four uh, documents in the RFC queue. And we also submitted three drafts to ISG for publication. Right now, there are still 11 uh, working group drafts actively in the working group. And all of them are very readable. We encourage you to read and comment. And since the last uh, meeting, we newly adopted four uh, working group documents. And here, we also want to highlight this TACAS TLS draft. Um, uh, we want to move it forward, and so we really need your comments and the review and your help. And anything more? On TACAS TLS, um, thank you. I don't see Alan in the room, but we have some comments. There are two open questions there around a dedicated well-known port. I think, Med, you commented there, and uh, whether or not we want to allow the obfuscation in the TLS uh, tunnel or channel. Um, we would like to, this was one of the things that we've been pushing on for a while. We would like to get this uh, through. So more comments. It's an easy draft, short draft to read. Uh, we'd really appreciate it. Thanks. Okay. Second. Yeah, a few, a few words to the, the PCAP set of IDs um, um, that is moving forward. Some of them actually, I think, are stable enough that we should uh, talk about them for extensive review to move them on the next stage. But I think they're not an agenda for today, and I think the agenda is packed. So here is the agenda. Uh, we have a very full, uh, a lot of content here. So the speakers, please keep your time. And uh, any agenda bashing? Uh, if no, that's the uh, start from the uh, IP fix extensions. Good afternoon, everybody. So I just want to keep a quick update on the two drafts on the SRE6 IP fix and on the on pass delay. Next slide, please. So uh, as previously mentioned, it's in the RFC editor queue. I just want to give a brief update on the implement 
accreditation status we received now on from IANA the code points. Uh, therefore, we implemented in Wireshark the dissector. It's publicly available. In PMACCT, the IPFIX data collection, we implemented the SRH segment IPv6 list, list section decoding. And uh, in the ITF 117 hackathon, the colleagues from the entity research uh, implemented uh, in XTP EVPF and implementation there. Uh, on the closed source side, we have two major vendors uh, who are working on an implementation. One should be uh, pretty much in uh, end of July be released, and another one uh, early next year. That's on the SRV6 side. Uh, let's move on 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 pass delay. Uh, here we updated the document. Uh, we added in the appendix uh, some examples. So please look at them and review them. And on the implementation status, the same team uh, who was working on the SRV6 IPFIX implementation also started to implement that in XTP EPPF. And as for the next steps, uh, we are looking in aligning uh, C the, between the IPFIX registry and the performance metrics registry, uh, what needs to be done there to update the draft documents. And here, uh, as a note, this is the first time where we are actually uh, define IPFIX information element and uh, refer them to the IPPM uh, performance matrix. Uh, then I think once this is done, we feel uh, the, the document will be ready for last call. So please, please have a look at it. And uh, we have two related works. One uh, is uh, describing uh, how uh, the document is applicable to IOM how that uh, the IPFIX part is being addressed and the other document extending IOM direct export with uh, timestamps. I think that was on the two documents. That's, that's it for 10 minutes? Yes, nice. so I try to be quick. Thank you. <laughs> any comments? We have... we have plenty of time for any comments on this. How many people have read these drafts? I feel there have been quite a few. Got a got a couple hands. A few, okay. Um, yeah, I I I'm really pleased to see the implementation progress. Thanks. And as uh, as Thomas said, please more comments on list. No discussion. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot. Yeah, next. Digital map five. Yes. Digital map. Sorry. Yeah, I think so. Hello, everybody. Uh, I will present in the name of the authors. Uh, Benoit, Oscar, Ahmed, Thomas, Ahmed. Please close to the mic. Hello? Yeah, next, please. So with this, uh, with this new draft, uh, we are sharing our experiences of modeling uh, network topologies and digital map using the RFC 8345 uh, and some augmentations. Uh, we are sharing the requirements for the digital map. Uh, we are introducing the concept of digital map and how it's related to the digital twinnet as it's defined by NMRG. We are also sharing some limitations that we found in the RFC 8345, but in regards to modeling of the digital map and not talking limitations of the RFC on its own, but in relation to using it to model digital map and some open issues we found. And we are discussing maybe some potential approaches we can take, but we are not addressing any or proposing any solutions for that. We, we see other drafts uh, uh, doing that. And also uh, we are kind of, uh, I will share here the next steps that we are going to do. Next, please. So some of the main objectives uh, of this work and the POC itself is just a methodology in order to uh, kind of evaluate uh, the ITF network topology model for the digital map. Uh, one of the main objectives was if the uh, young modules could be a good basis to model a digital map. 
and then also how the different topology modules uh, fit together. That's very important thing. We started with some and we will continue to work with the others. We model digital map entities, relationship rules, and some aggregated entities and relationship. We also want to evaluate if the base model supports key requirements that emerge for a specific layer. We modeled multiple uh, layers from layer two uh, uh, up to the customer service layer, and we want to see how easy it is to extend the base model to support new technology, and can the base model be augmented for any new layer, new technology. So you can see here on the right, I won't go through it, different technologies that we evaluated during uh, this talk. Next, please. So we can see here the activity in the ITF and over 60 uh, modules that are augmenting the, the core uh, ITF network topology models. So there are the modules, there are different uh, activities there. These are the ratified modules. So we will, uh, we started with uh, looking at few of them, but the goal is to evaluate all of them and see whether and, and come up with some guidelines about how to augment the, the core model in order to support the digital map. Next, please. Uh, so why digital map? Like digital twin is defined in the NMRG and please look there for the definition of the digital twin. It collects different data, it stores different data, it has information about actions and behaviors. Uh, so we looked at how all these things are connected and correlated uh, in the digital twin. And uh, we are proposing that uh, they should be correlated uh, using the topological entities at different layers. So hence, we introduced the digital map concept here, which provides a core basic model uh, of the topological information, model and data of the topological information of the network. And it correlates all digital twin data and models topological entities at different layers. Next, please. So digital map is the core multi-layer topology model of the digital twin that defines the core topological entities. Here we can see four concepts, network node, link, and termination point. They would be at different layers. Different network types could be used as a kind of layers and sub-layers. Their role in the network is defined through these types, core properties identified, and core relationship, topological relationships, because here we are focusing on topologies only. So this model is the basic topological model that links all other functional uh, parts of the digital twin, like configuration, maintenance, insurance, et cetera. Next, please. Um, so these are some of the use cases. I, uh, they are just listed. We didn't elaborate further on, on those. We may discuss if the separate draft may be needed for these. So these are the core digital uh, map use cases that we collected from the operators and uh, you know, they're different from basic inventory queries uh, to the closed loop at the end. Next, please. We also identified requirements for the digital map. And as you can see, basic six requirements are already supported by the RFC. And that's one of the reasons why we picked RFC A345 as a basis for the digital map modeling. Some uh, are partially supported, uh, and we would kind of uh, go with augmenting and extending the, we will propose augmentation and extensions of the RFC, but there are also others like uh, extensible with metadata, pluggable for specific functional model and optimized for graph traversals that would need further analysis. Next, please. Uh, the following are the limitations for digital map modeling that we found. So ITF network topology model only have unidirectional link does not support bidirectional. It only supports point-to-point -point connectivity, not multi-point connectivity. It doesn't allow links between different networks. It allows only links inside the network. There are some supporting relationships that are not uh, allowed, like what we needed uh, during the uh, our analysis and prototyping is TP to node supporting a node network. Uh, we think we need to add, uh, add semantics to some relationships, uh, supporting relationships to specify the context. Uh, also, termination point roles are missing. Uh, layers and sub-layers, there is further analysis if they could be modeled through network uh, types. Uh, we have to look at tunnel and parts and underlay because uh, RFC 8795 defines those additionally to the A345, so we need further analysis to see 
you that the throat should be used. Next, please. Uh, some high-level observations. Uh, as I mentioned, we modeled uh, digital map in two different labs. Uh, we allowed of augmentation of different layers and technologies. And the, the, beside the limitations that we found, there are some open issues that we are still investigating. In some cases, there is a need for separation of layer two and layer three, but in some cases, uh, the operators wanted a kind of unified uh, layer. Then. Uh, layers versus sublayers, uh, then generic IGP routing with pass versus uh, basic OSPF ISIS, and same technology a different layer, for example, multi layered for BGP underlay versus uh, VPN BGP layer. Next, please. So these are some things that we are going to do next. We will continue uh, to use POC as a methodology to analyze uh, and improve the. Uh, ITF RFCs for digital map. We will evaluate technology specific augmentations one by one and, and come back to ITF with our observations. Uh, we will see how to fulfill all the digital map requirements and propose solutions, uh, how to connect to external world, other young modules, but also not young only. We have BMP, IP fix, et cetera. How to remove the identified limitations, and we will propose guidelines of how to augment the new technologies and report observations for all. So, for some of these topics, we will need new drafts. Uh, there is already a draft that Nigel will present after this, which is looking at two improvements and limitations that we identified by directional and multi point, but we will need other drafts to address other limitations and open issues. Thank you. Daniela. Hello, Daniela Ceccarelli. So when you speak about the technology specific augmentation, are you referring to optical, OTN, microwave, stuff like that? Okay. Yeah, included. There yeah. is there is already a lot of work being done in CCAMP. Make sure to have uh, to have an alignment with uh, uh, with them, Absolutely. with us speaking Absolutely. as a CCAMP chairman. Yeah, absolutely. They, they were not the initial ones that we picked for analysis because we, we didn't have in the lab optical. So, you know, we were looking at some other, but definitely for the optical, we would okay. uh, analyze them and then Thanks. see. Thank you very much. Uh, I have more or less the same comment as Daniele. There is already some work done in, in CCAMP as well in TISA. So yeah. we maybe need to look at that work. And uh, maybe we need to write the guideline we discussed last week, a few days, or Monday, because we have also worked out about the possibility to have a single topology instance which support multiple layers. Uh, and we are enhancing our work there to do that. So there is a lot of experience we have done there. OK, thanks. I put myself in the queue as a contributor, or as a participant. Um, why the name Digital Map? Um, Digital twin evokes a kind of, this is my test. This is going to model a production or real device. And I, it seems to me that this work is more than just about doing lab or, or simulations. It's more about a holistic service and topology type of, of model or, or service and topology type or, or service and, and physical logical network topology. Yeah. When we looked at the digital twin, we saw uh, lots of models and, and, and data, you know, and in assurance, configuration, provisioning, all of it. But how do you combine all these different uh, uh, data and models? How do you uh, put them together? Like we started looking at intent assurance initially, but then there was a feedback from the providers. You know, we want to see that data in the context of layered network uh -huh. topology. So that was the core reason. If you look at one function, of one silo or, or even configuration or traffic engineering, it all goes back to those layered topologies. So we thought if we come up and propose this, this core uh, layered network topologies, that that's the way how all these things could be taken, brought together and as a target uh, for the closed loop. Because if you have all of these things uh, connected, uh, then it would be possible to achieve, uh, you know, first reduction in the uh, identification of the problem and location and solving the problem manually, but later to do it automatically through the closed loop. But it's not just applicable to digital twin, I guess, is what it could be used just in general. In, it in, could, yeah, yeah, it could be used in general, yeah. Benoit, real quick. Yeah. 
Benoit class. So in my mind, Joe, there is like a topology, there's the twin. The twin is a replica of the network that you right. could play with offline. Mm -hmm. Depending on what you want to do, right, there, you need a lot of things in the twin. It's like you might need the topology, the layers, you might need all the flows, you might need the load, you might need the traffic, you might need everything depending on what you want to do. So that's a step in between. That's a step to go to the twin. You need to get the, the, the layer right, the modeling right to start with. Sure. I, I just meant that there's more applicability here, I think, than just digital. I think we're going to have, is it quick? Yeah. Okay. I hope so. <laughs> Carsten um, I think if you want to go more in depth beyond this kind of educational level that the current draft has, then it would also be nice to look at the benchmarking methodology working group, which might be a home for a real digital twin standard, like provide, providing uh, assistance to the um, you know testing community, how to test with digital twins. They have actually been around for a long time. They were called network emulators, but of course, under the name Digital Twin, it sounds much more nice. Thank you. Thank Thank you. Thank you, Helga. Thank you very much. Who is next? Um, Hi, I'm Nigel Davis Siena. Um, I'm just going to present the um, work that Olga just mentioned at the end of her uh, presentation. Just to say, this this work uh, originated outside the digital map work, so it's not just driven by digital map. It's driven by general concerns over the ability of RFC 8345 to represent some of the topology we encounter. Next slide, please. Thanks. So. Um, to summarize what, what I want to talk about, um, to improve the capability to support multipoint and um, unidirectional bidirection, which I summarize as unibi. Um, and as Olga said, H345 focuses on unidirectional and point-to-point. Uh, -point. Um, um, we've encountered over many years, many um, cases of um, multipoint um, bidirectional, semi-unidirectional bidirectional, et cetera, um, uh, cases. And we've also got uh, models that support that sort of um, uh, structure in other bodies. So um, the proposal is to enhance backward compatibility 8345 to support this um, these unibi structures in multipoint structures in more uh, a more efficient way than the current um, method proposed in 8345. Uh, next slide, please. Thanks. So uh, just an experience. Uh, we've had uh, many experiences. I'll, I'll I only got five minutes. So I'll zip through this quickly. Um, many experiences um, through this um, uh, in uh, multiple technologies and also in multiple uh, device management activities. So I mentioned down there TMF MTNM, which which is an old older interface, but that used to support a multipoint unibi link and connection structure. Uh, TL1, ancient stuff. Again, multipoint unibi. ONF Tappy's multipoint unibi, and it, it, it's a very beneficial structure to support some complexity. Um, uh, and it emphasizes that thing as a, an atomic unit, essentially. So it gives you an efficient model. Next slide, please. So I've, in the draft, I, I thought it was better not to just to say we should make it multipoint unibi and then leave it at that. So I've put some uh, uh, a Yang sketch in. The, the tree is not actually in the draft. There's some Yang in the draft. But uh, there are some issues with the Yang. Obviously, it's only a 0, zero draft at the moment. So uh, initial one. So Olga and I have been working on improving this. Uh, we can make some, certainly make some good improvements to this as a result of the discussions. So the, uh, but the, um, the method used here, there are two methods proposed in the, in the draft. One is to simply insert um, a point list in the structure below source and destination. Source and destination are optional. So um, we can insert an optional point list and then say, okay, you can either use the point list or the source and destination. It doesn't break existing solutions they can carry on using that, but it allows us to add more sophisticated support in when necessary. The other um, method proposed in the draft, which I haven't put in here, is to um, use a, to extract source and destination, then re-augment them back in again. That's not compatible Yang, but it appears to give compatible JSON instance output. So it's um, compatible with the outputs. And then that gives more control over whether you're going to go unidirectional point to point or going to go bidirectional multi-point uh, and so on, uni by multi-point. So you can actually control it with a feature. So I can say I'm only using unidirectional point-to-point or I'm using bi-directional uh, multi-point. 
So uh, anyway, we'll, we'll work, continue to work on this, um, this Yang to improve this uh, in following drafts and then hopefully we can proceed. Um, next slide, please, thanks. So the, just to emphasize the um, efficiency of this method, if I've got a, um, if I use the current RCH345 mechanism to represent multipoint um, bidirectional structures, then I have to use the structure on the right-hand side, which has multiple unidirectional point-to-point -point links to a pseudo-no structure, and then provides me with a, a sort of support for the multipointedness. The, um, the structure on the left is uh, the multipoint unibi thing because it's just a single structure with points on the edges that reference um, TPs. Um, and the structure benefits from a um, what we call in ONF a specification, a machine interpretable specification that explains the internal um, forwarding that's available. The, the picture below shows a, a root and leaf structure. So the two dots on the um, or squares on the um, on the right-hand side don't have interconnectability because their leaves, the two squares on the left-hand side have interconnectability, their roots. So that gives me the root-to-root -root flow, the leaf-to-root -root flows, but no leaf-leaf flow. And that structure is one of the many different options you might have for the four-pointed things, hence you need to describe it. The same is true for the pseudonode. You still have to have some kind of connectivity um, matrix or something to explain the flow in there. So it doesn't get away with not having it just because it's... Um, a pseudo node. So this provides a much more efficient structure. And of course, you can see it degenerates back to uh, a, a, a unidirectional point to point if you only have two points and make it unidirectional. So it gives you support for the existing structure if you want to, but also extends it to much more sophisticated um, assemblies. So if you could do the next slide, please. I thought I only had five minutes, by the way. I seem to have nine down the bottom. Yeah, th that's what the time uh, came out in the agenda. Oh, so okay. I think overall in this uh, digital map, we might have allocated more time. Okay, okay, nice stuff. So um, as Olga mentioned, there are other um, areas of improvement uh, that we can we can look at. Um, th these came in independently, actually, of what Olga was doing initially, and they're, they're, they're a good intersection with what they're doing in the digital map work anyway. So to termination point direction, it would seem beneficial to be able to state whether a termination point in the topology is actually only unidirectional or bidirectional, and that obviously then extends this to allow an understanding of compatibility between the multi-pointed unibi structure and the terminations. Specification of capability I, I mentioned, I know we've got the, um, the I think it's connection matrix, I can only speak the name of it, but uh, but that provides a set of unidirectional point-to-point -point descriptions of interconnectability of, of a node but that tends to be very inefficient if you've got uh, large structures and it also tends to um, lose symmetry and patterns because you just get a lot of large number of lines. So um, potentially a more advanced mechanism using some um, specification of capability that would take advantage of rules or something of this sort might be worthwhile looking at. Um, I don't cover these in the draft other than just by noting them, of course. Uh, links between networks, Olga mentioned. So we've got many situations where we've got a link um, link going out of one domain into another. Um, richness of navigation. So the ability to, we've got a limited navigation in RTA 345. We might want a richer navigation, but we then need to consider whether this is for conveying over an interface where you want to minimize the number of um, statements you make to convey the information, or whether it's for navigation in a repository where you want to enrich the number of relationships so you speed the navigation up. So we need to look at that carefully and understand what the purpose is and there may be several focuses. Um, also relationships, um, uh, role relationships. So this is indi indicating what the point, what act, uh, what function the point is playing in the multi-point structure. So I mentioned root and leaf. So a point might have a, a root role or a leaf role. It might have some protection role, et cetera, et cetera. The whole range of different um, things you want to express. And again, the specification mechanism helps you to understand those, but just by simply labeling them, that gives us sufficient information about the asymmetry if we're just observing it. So, um, and the generalized model of flow, um, hence not just links, but also be able to represent flow links a capability for enabling flow, whereas a statement of actual flow might be necessary again in the digital map. It depends on how, what depth you want to go to to describe the network as to whether you need to go down this path or not. And then layering and sub-layering, again, uh, that also relates strongly to the, um, the stuff that I was doing, but the ability to represent um, multi-layer nodes, multi-layer networks, and also um, sub-layers. And just back to my other experiences with TAPI, we have a 
a strong sublayer model and a strong multi multi node model and so on so i'm trying to bring some of those experiences of deployment of those capabilities to this this work if you can do the next slide uh well before we do that you have two people in the okay. queue do you want to take questions now or um, wait i don't think i've got one more slide actually but if you just i have indeed so i might okay. well just do that and then, then i'll take the question so um looking for support um we did get some obviously the digital maps already getting support for the multi-point um uh, uni buying mechanism so uh, looking for more support and also um, want to understand how to progress this work obviously working with Olga again Olga mentioned we might want to do some additional drafts for some of the more some of the other areas and maybe some over over arching draft that helps guide us through that uh, that work so and to consider those other areas okay so that, that was that's what I had as my um, core obviously I can go back to other pieces um, in if we want to and I'll take questions Alex yeah, Alex Klem. So, yes, interesting presentation. I need to re read up on your draft. I have not read it okay. yet. Uh, I do have one comment, actually, regarding uh, clearly the goal basically to simplify things. I mean, I think that's, that, that, that's yeah, I think that's, that's well taken, well understood, and clearly basically it simplifies the navigation so far that you would otherwise mm. to have uh, based on, if you were to base it purely on 8345. Mm. How, however, at the same time, basically, this does mean that you're opening the possibility that you have multiple alternatives to represent the same artifacts in the same model. And whenever you have multiple alternatives, it can potentially also, so, again, add yeah. to the complexity. So any, any thoughts, actually, yeah, on how I, to I mitigate actually, that? Yeah, so it's, it's potentially slightly sneaky in a way, because I'm thinking the multi-point unit by supports all the point-to-point -point unidirectional ones anyway. So hopefully, as we introduce that, that capability, it'll be seen as the way of supporting the other situations, I don't, to, I don't want to take away the existing capability because that would be very damaging, clearly. And I know there's a concern in T's that this this work is going to try and remove the ability to do point-to-point -point, um, uh, unidirectional in the way it currently can be done. So what I'm really doing is, is trying to introduce an evolution from that point-to-point -point unidirectional to a multi-point unibuy that can do point-to-point -point unidirectional without, without ripping the rug out from everybody who's using the point-to-point -point, um, current mechanism. So it's it's hoping to say... That's the that's the goal. That's what we're trying to get to. We're not going to deprecate obsolete or anything else. The current mechanism, but eventually we hope people will see this is a better way of doing it anyway. If that makes enough sense. So the two options are aimed to be two options in a transition. Okay. All right. Thanks. Okay. I'll, I'll I'll review your draft. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ahmed Hassani from Swisscom. Thank you for the talk. I haven't read the full draft yet. It's fine. Don't worry. It's fine. So. <laughs> I'm sorry if I asked you this question. The first question, uh, I have two, two things. The one is the question uh, regarding slide four when you showed the Yang tree, if I understood correctly. Yeah. Basically, the link ID is the only mandatory thing there. It, except we're, we're discussing removing link ID now and using the TP references. Uh, this is only a very recent yesterday. Yeah. So um, we, may, we may not need to have a specific explicit ID. We may better use the TP reference itself because it's, it's unique. Um, and I, I, we've been looking at what might be inside. Yeah, my ahead. regard is not regarding the link ID. Oh, oh, sorry, link. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Um, sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, link, my worry link, there, if ahead. you leave everything optional, like what does it mean when you have a link that doesn't have a source of destination? Is it unplugged? Is it abstract? That's something probably we need to clarify and make sure it's 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 intended to be all optional. I worry so, when everything is optional. Yeah, um, I, I've only taken eight two four five as it is. Um, yeah. So I've not modified any of the optionality or uh, of I, any of the existing things. I took advantage of the optionality of the existing pieces. Yeah. Um, you can have a link with no points All right. currently. And the second point is more like a, a feedback. Thank you. Uh, I'm not sure if you have looked at uh, network markup language that was standardized by the Open Grid Forum. Uh, I, did, I did actually a while ago. I haven't yeah. recently. I looked at it because you know, it was interesting that it was obviously working in the network space, but I haven't looked at it. Could we, perhaps we could talk on that. Yeah, and yeah. one idea for the, from them, they said we will not model, we will not have different types of links. And mm. instead of that, we will have something called another abstraction called link group. So links are always unidirectional. And if you have bidirectional or multi-point links, then you group them together. And then mm. you can have a link group that will tell you mm. like, okay, these are a bundle together. You have to look at them. Yeah. So one yeah. just an alternative idea yeah. that we might yeah, have that's to consider at some point. We, we, I think you can sort of envisage the link here as as a link group without the need to actually state the underlying links. Yeah. So it's sort of like a, it's trying to say, well, if I had that group, then it gives me all of the information I need to get essentially. 
why not roll it all up into one thing? But I'd be interested in talking with you more on that. Exactly. Thank, Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Italo Buzzi. Uh, for the experience I've seen in TIS and SIC, um, for the bidirectional, I think the two links, uh, unidirectional works perfectly because also we can easily associate them by starting and ending on the same pair of TPs. Mm. So if I have uh, a, a bidirectional link, I have a unidirectional link from A to B and another unidirectional link from B to A, yeah. and then, uh, then that works very well. I don't see why this approach cannot work with P2MP or with multi-point to multi-point. It, For multi-point to multi-point, I think the N square is really an issue. But if you start thinking about that, uh, if you want to associate the characteristics like uh, delay or bandwidth availability, mm. uh, mm. maybe the N square problem is unavoidable. So it depends. I, I, if you only want to give uh, reachability in a multi-point to multi-point, I can see a possibility yeah. to, to save. Yeah. Uh, yeah. some information but if you want to give uh, information about every every possible relationship at the edge uh, of the multipoint links mm -hmm. you end up anyhow with a multi with an mm -hmm. n square uh, problem you, yeah. one thing i tell on that as well is that, that obviously at, at an extreme yes you do end up with that but the the mechanism here isn't intended to prevent you from adding all of that detail so you know we've looked if you, i know you've looked in the onf work as well we can add detail in in um in a in the sort of specification like structure so you can bring that up and make it an instance structure and then you can add per point you know, assemblies and so on if you've got that but rarely do you have it that complex often you've got a, a group of points and they've got a similar delay or a group of points they got it so the grouping of points appears to be a highly beneficial thing to take out a lot of noise in the model and that's the problem so is the amount of noise in the something model. like a the rule that uh, works for most of the cases and few exceptions. That, that's right, that's right. The, uh, and again, in the ONF work, we've seen that you, it's the same with the, the specification I mentioned. You can define, um, if you've got a very symmetric thing with similar, you know, similar delays that I don't care about the difference in, in ONF, the specification statement set all, just groups all the points together and says any connectivity, full stop. So very compact. If you start to get groups of points as you do in some, networks that have a similar behavior another group similar behavior but a different behavior between them you group them group them and then put a rule in between them so you start to get more more richness but not immense amounts of complexity so it's really trying to take away the complexity from the problems where there isn't any but allow the introduction of that as a, in a sort of a sophisticated way so if i do get a extremely asymmetric case where every single point's got a different relationship to every other guess, point, point it's got that underlying but it's still within that atomic unit so I, I capture the atomic unit as a set of points, and then I can describe all the complexity within that atomic unit, rather than having lots of lots of apparently separate things that I can't see the wood for the trees. It's trying to emphasize this is intended to be a multi-point, multi-point bidirectional thing. So you want to, to compact the situation in the cases where there are uh, uh, multiple right. common situations. That's right. That's uh, right. And it, it's it also follows on from the notion of some of the service models, which say I've got them, and then I put rules between them. So it's really taking that as the, you know, the tri driving it with the purpose, multi-pointedness. Oh, and we are over time. Thank oh, you, Nigel. Okay. Um, I will say as chair to the authors of this work, it sounds like, and you can nod if uh, that, that you're looking for it. You've got some actions here with Alex and Italo and Ahmed. It sounds like you're looking for more, to, to do more iteration and, and yes. perhaps come back to the working yes. group later on. Is that yes. correct? Okay. Certainly, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Do we encourage more discussions in the mailing list? And also with Tia's hat chairs on, we have invited them to make the presentation also oh. in this because I think it's also relevant for traffic engineering. Uh, you're up for service attachment, right? No. No? No, I attachment have the, circuits? The, the topology. No, that's okay. for that nope. method. That's good. Okay, but for the uh, ISIS topology. Uh, sorry, it's, it's scrolled down too much. I apologize. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now in this work, what we want to do, the aim is to model the carrier's topology and to be able to play with it. So just go up to, to the next slide, please. So here, okay, first of all, why, why we need this and what is the rationale of the work that we are trying? So here, what we do in the operations is we perform this uh, regular capacity planning to see, okay, where do we need to grow? Uh, also, we need to do simulations on on that. So here, uh, the question that uh, that we asked is: Okay, we are uh, in order to 
to do this and to put this information in these uh, planning tools, uh, we have had to do it in many, many different ways, taking information from different sources. So the question was, can we use the ITF topology model to represent our network and make uh, meaningful simulations from that? Okay. And okay, we took the existing uh, the multiple RFCs that are around. So we just uh, we have the T topology, we have the, the, the base topology, etc. We put together and we said, okay, with this, is it enough? And say, well, almost, okay. And there were some few things, okay, that uh, we took. Okay, so here in this draft, what we document or we try to document is, okay, which are these small things we needed to add uh, to the topology and also the plan is to show, okay, this is the way how we can uh, represent this, this network. Okay, so next slide, please. So use cases that we are covering, the one of them is the design, okay, so okay, our engineers, they or design or planners, they plan and they configure the the, the network with the, some ISIS, and then we can check oh, if it's according to what we said that we wanted to, to have. Also, the um, analyze the, the failure, so we can just run our <laughs> simulations and see, okay, what, what happens here, there, um, even with more, more complex uh, algorithms, and do what if scenarios, okay, so based on this, we can modify some parameters here. We have kind of agencies, reconfigure weight to see how the traffic is, is going and the capacity planning. So, okay, so uh, with the forecast of the traffic that we can get from different source, okay, see where do we need to, to grow, okay? So for all of this, well, it is clear that one of the things that we want to do is um, have this, this map. So take, take into account that this is the, this is the, the scope. So here we are not, targeting just to, to say is, uh, are we targeting to trace a very specific uh, traffic flow? No. Okay. So just to, to be clear, this is not the target of this, uh, of this particular draft. For that, you would need to have all the digital map, including routing policies, maybe including access control, maybe all the details, because for a specific flow, maybe things are not. So this can carry the wood. So next slide, please. So the, the relation with the ex existing works is there is already a device ISIS model. That model is just to configure and retrieve the information from the router itself. Here, this is complementing because it gives you a, a network-wide uh, perspective. And also in the digital map, you have the also, it, it puts into context and complements with the uh, rest of information from the, the network. So it's kind of complementary. So next slide, please. So the, um, how, we, uh, how we manage to, to work, okay? So uh, our, uh, our networks in, in Telefonica, what they are is they are made of several ISIS processes that are interconnected. Typically, there is one router that uh, it connects to two separate or to two, even three uh, domains or ISIS processes. And what we said is, how, how do we model this? So we will have one instance of the ITF network for each of these processes, okay? So uh, if we have, uh, for example, uh, 100 of these processes, we export or we model this as 100 ITF uh, networks. And if there is one node that participate in mo many of these processes, it will be present in uh, many of these IFTF networks. So just to be clear that the IFTF networks are views of the network, okay? So there is not a, a single network having, the network is the reality, and these are just views of the network that we use for uh, purposes, okay? For these uh, planning purposes. And the, the extension I'm not going to enter into the, into the detail is just in the network types, we added some hint to say, hey, to whoever is reading this, this is a view, including uh, that are nodes that are talking ISIS to each other. Okay, this is this. If you read that, you can understand. Okay, what this topology is about. Then we had to add some node level information and some termination and some information at the termination point to include the um, the level, the area address, um, the metric, 
this can be published later, okay? So this, we implemented this, it works. We, may, we know that there are some information that might be redundant or it can be placed, but this worked so far, okay? So it was good. So next slide, please. So what, what is the, the implementation, the status of this, of this drug? So here, what uh, we used it is uh, to, in one of our uh, operation, to uh, take it, prepare this model, send it to a couple of tools, no assumptions, okay, hey, this is, you, you are only allowed to uh, do the analysis based on, on what we have, and we, um, uh, it was, uh, it's also is in production, this, uh, getting this, inform this information from a, one a area of the, of the network and um, use it also in the digital map of, of Huawei, uh, it's also model the ISS with a slightly different uh, approach. So we need to converge in the in the details of the ISIS. And the one planning tool from Miller House also has, uh, he's able to read this, uh, this model and make simulations um, based on it. So uh, next slide, please. So the, um, here, what we just need to do is just to work uh, together with, uh, with you and improve the, these details of the young models. If there are something that is redundant, take it out, add any specific here and there, and align it also with the device uh, model. Also, please, if you're interested, uh, read the document and ask if, if it, this is the right place to, to work in these topics, if it's obsessed the, if the good place. And also, we would like also to get, of course, also some feedback from the routine area because I think this is also has to do uh, with the routing area. So just any questions here? So just here, this is how that is clear that it is not going to solve the world, it's going to solve some specific um, problem that I think is common to quite to the carriers. We have people in the queue. Olga Havel, Huawei. I just wanted to mention Olga, you may Oscar. Wanna... Olga, yeah. there you go. Hello? Yep, yeah. uh, much I just better. wanted to mention, uh, Oscar, that kind of you looked at two options, side the two model areas as network or to have a flat network structure. And because of one of the limitations that the OSPF areas cannot have links between them in the RFC, uh, you looked at having the area addresses there as a property. Would you consider if you if you change and do augment uh, RFC uh, to to use areas as networks, or would you prefer to keep it this way? Um, it's uh, open for us. Maybe for for scalability also. We this is why we decided one network, one uh, one uh, set of one domain only. The, taking into account we. We are doing this for, for example for our, our Brazil network, which it has 25,000 nodes. Okay, so having one network with the 25,000 nodes, uh, uh, we said okay, we prefer to to break to break it down, and that was the main reason to have one instance of the ATF network per <laughs> per domain. Okay, so this was the why we thought it. But the other is is completely feasible, and also the the choice that we made is mainly because we didn't have inter inter AES links. So we have one router belongs to different uh, areas, okay? So then it simplified a little bit the, the things, okay? Uh, but also we, what we had is to, on below these uh, networks, a full, uh, full IETF network with all the nodes, but just with the, with the nodes, just to have it as, let's like, say, as a glue uh, together. Okay. Thanks. Um, hi, thanks for presenting this. Um, I can't speak as to whether this working is interesting in the work. I don't know. That's up to the working room to decide. But you're asking, is this the right place to bring this work? And it might be. Um, I do have concerns that OPSA, the is a very sort of scattered working group. So this may need a more dedicated place. So that's something we need to try and figure out where to do it. I would, I'm not trying to send you away here because it's probably the right home. I would at least try and advertise this in RTG, RTGWG. And I'd also advertise in LSR just so that the routing folks are aware that you're doing this, and they may say bring it over here or something, something like that, but at least make them aware. Uh, and you may be able to get into RTWG on Friday. I don't know if they've got space on their agenda, but I don't. Okay, we'll do that. We'll do advertise it. But here, just take it on, we're not touching the, the LSR itself. We are just 
how to bring this information to the outside world, which LSR guys don't care too much. I mean, we are <laughs> how yeah. to feed the rest of the world. <laughs> I, I think this is probably the right place. It's just like letting them know yeah, okay. and advertising. That's all I'm going to say. Thank you. Well, Rob kind of echoed my thing sentiment as, as co-chair i would i would say how much is this dependent on the other digital map works since you mentioned it and um yeah obviously as rob said we could bring it to the working group on list but i want to make sure that there's not dependency it, here it, it is i mean they they will work together i mean it, it's for the full picture but this can be for a particular use case with this, the capacity okay. planning can you can work on let's say on on your own but to be okay. meaningful for ITF, it makes sense all the models together. I mean, it's when you, you create really the map. This is one part of the map. If you, you have the, the full but root map, this it is can one. Be, it can be atomically considered, is it what you're saying. It can be atomically okay. consumed, but okay. it makes more sense having together with the service, together with the other things in the, in the, when it makes more, more sense. Okay, thanks. Access control. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, this is Chu Fang, and this presentation is about the policy based network access control. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Yeah. And to give a brief recap, the, the motivation of this work is that. The conventional network access control is usually based on the IP addresses or transparent uh, packet fields, but this is usually not inflexible. Uh, this is usually not flexible enough in the expression of the real world enterprise network access, where the mobile office and the, the BYOD bring your own device is so common and makes the IP address of the users change very frequently. And also, we usually would like the different security policies uh, to be applied to the same user under different circumstances, like uh, depending on the user's access location, their role, and the time of the day, and the, the de devices they are used. And so the proposed solution, uh, we're trying to provide the enforcement of the network access control based on the group identity uh, that said, uh, for example, to permit or deny the uh, network traffic from a source a group a group ID and slash or to a destination group ID. And these access policies that on the group identity could be predetermined and uh, static actually, but uh, we can say that the user the group, which, the, uh, which group the user is assigned could be dynamically determined during the user's authentication when it tries to connect to the enterprise network. Next slide, please. Okay, so since the uh, last presentation happened in the November last year, we have received a lot of valuable comments and great input from the working group. And based on that, some high-level document updates that we have uh, change, uh, change our young modules. For example, we define now it's a common schedule young module and we use it in our SL extension to support the date and time-based policy activation. And uh, also we extend the SL module to support a generalized endpoint group to cover the user group and device group. The device group could be like some enterprise IoT devices like the camera, the printer, or some uh, servers in the DC networks. And we, the device group could be used when uh, there is no user integration. And, and also we specify the de definition of endpoint group in user module. I will, I will show the young module in the next slide, but currently the uh, endpoint group is with only one necessary group ID defined. And also now the group best SL uh, young module is generalized and we do not limit whether it can be used as a device level or as a network level. And usage examples are added in the latest version and also some editorial imp improvement. Next slide, please. So for this slide, I would like to show the young module update in, in the latest version. So instead of we coupling all the 
time and that best uh, policy activation configuration and the SL extension, we now uh, just decouple the, the, the configuration into two young modules. The first one is the IETF schedule young module and two groupings I defined. One is the period grouping, another is the recurrency. This is compliant with the, uh, the period of time and the recurrency rule defined in uh, FC 15.5-14.5 respectively. I think it's an effort in the art area uh, to specify a comprehensive information model to specify the uh, calendaring and the scheduling information. And this, uh, this, this uh, scheduling information, this young module defined here is quite comprehensive. So uh, this is intended to also could be reusable in other scheduling contexts. Okay, then the, the, second, the second young module is the, regarding the uh, SL extension, which we call the UCL SL. And for this, for this young module, we augment the SL list with an endpoint uh, group container with an endpoint group list inside. And the key is the group ID to uni uniquely identify the which, uh, which endpoint group it is. And also, we allow it to be referenced, we allow the group ID to be referenced in the SL match criteria. And finally, we augment, uh, we, we use the uh, grouping defined in the schedule young module to uh, implement the time variant access control. So as I mentioned earlier, now the SL extension, the module we define here, we do not restrict whether it's used as a network module or device module. It depends on the, the implementation. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so for next, for next step, the authors would like to include the application as the third endpoint group type, other than the user group and the device group. I think uh, this uh, can be useful for the scenario when a device may run multiple applications and to which and for different applications, it, um, different access policies may need to be applied. And this uh, to implement this might require the device or network controller to identify the application type based on the traffic detection. And also the authors believe that this work, uh, the current version has been mature enough and has asked for the working group adoption on the mailing list. I would really appreciate the cheers to tell us what else is needed for this work to move forward. Thank you. Want to run a poll, Hank, for the room? We got a lot of people online to see. We got some time to see what if, if poll, should we adopt this? Does the working group want to work on this? It's coming. Stand by. Okay, so if there's interest in adopting, raise hand. If you're not interested, do not raise hand. I have a question before raising hands. So is this implemented somewhere or? Yes, uh, we, we do have the related- Can you please uh, state your name? Gargi. Yeah. yeah, we do have some re related implementations in our enterprise network scenario. And so wherever this policy <clears throat> is implemented on the devices, configured on the devices, uh, it would need like a deep packet inspection in order to get to the user ID and the application ID in the packet. Sorry, I, I you, so, you, you mean the, how to get the user ID or group uh, and the application, application ID, ID right? so you have to kind of. Yeah, when the user tries to uh, connect to the network, they will, because it's for enterprise network scenarios that usually tries to uh, require to authenticate it as an NIS network access points a server and then it will work as the like triple a client to connect to the triple s server which 
and will uh, store the, some map, some information to which the user's account and uh, which a group ID the user should be assigned. So will this policy be deployed on the application servers which will do the authentication or the network devices which are inspecting the packets? The policy should be uh, deployed on the network controller or and, and network uh, devices at the PEP devices, policy enforcement point. So it would require inspecting inside the packet at the service level in order to authenticate. Yeah. Hi, this is Alan. I just have um, one comment. Um, yeah. The attributes, I think, says they can go into the accounting packets, but there's no description as to what that means, if I'm correct. Sorry, you um, mean what parameter? The, the name of the policy. The name of the policy. I mean, why yeah. is policy best, right? I think yeah. the, the, the policy is a, a set of rules, like we use the time and uh, dead best activation to uh, specify when the SL policy is applicable. So it's a policy, it's time best policy, right? Yeah. yeah. So. Um, okay, never mind. I'll, I'll, I'll take it to the list. We're running out of time. Okay, <laughs> thank you. So it looks like there is quite a bit of support in room or online, so we can take this and do a call on list. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Attachment circuits. Yeah, so yeah, th this will be the, uh, I would say an update of the um, attachment circuit work we are doing with the uh, set of colleagues. So next, next slide, please. So this is just a, a reminder about, I would say the, um, the current pyramid of this work we are doing here. There are at least four drafts that we are, I would say, developing with the, with the group. The first one, which is the um, attachment circuit common, which is defined, I would say, um, various group that are usable for various attachment contexts, including the uh, service layer and network layer. And then there is this attachment circuit as a service, which is basically focusing on how you can expose attachment circuit as a service to, to customers. And this one, um, it does not make any, I would say, assumption about the internal structure of the services themselves, neither how, which um, restriction other services can reuse, I would say, the, um, the, the grouping we are, we are defining there. And then there is this, this third, I would say, document which is defining the uh, attachment circuit at the network level, how you can bind them to the, uh, to the service attachment points. Uh, this is focusing mainly on the configuration at the network side and how you can present them to, uh, at, at the network controller. And the, the last document that we uh, developed recently is what we call the uh, attachment circuit glue. This one is um, binding, I would say, the uh, l and m and the l and, and also the layer two uh, models with the attachment circuit configuration that you can do uh, outside. Next slide, please. Uh, so the, since last, last IETF meeting, we, uh, we made, um, I would say, some progress on the, uh, on the various sets of the specifications that are, I would say, summarized in the, in the table we are providing to you here. So no need to go uh, into uh, each of them. Uh, we have the, uh, the, 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 um, the, the various, I would say, iteration of the draft that we released. This is basically to address some of the comments we received from the, uh, some of the, um, uh, of the um, uh, colleagues who are involved in this works, including, for example, how you can control the way you can place the bearers in the networks, controlling the uh, determination and the diversity of the uh, service attachment uh, point themselves, how you can control also a layer two um, uh, configuration in some specific points, Explain, uh, explain also how you, we can provision the, uh, the IDs and how you can orchestrate the, uh, some identifiers between, I would say, the, the C part and the, and the P part by providing more examples and illustrating them. The, the issues are there. You can, you can, you can, there are a pointer which is provided, so feel free if you are interested in some of this to, uh, to, uh, to, to provide your, your comments. Next slide, please. Um, so in, in addition to the work we are doing in, into the, I would say, the stabilization of the work and providing, I would say, more content and, 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 and having it more finalized. So the working group has received a listen statement from the uh, Oran working group who are interested in this work. So this is, they are using, I would say, both the, the slicing service model, which is developed in the TS working group and the, the, uh, the, the set of the attachment circuits. 
um, between, I would say, the, um, the, 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 the sites. Um, I don't remember there, that there is any uh, reply sent from the OPSA working up to, uh, to, to Oran. Uh, next slide, please. On the TGPP part, so th th there is really a major modification that they the brought to their, I would say, INRAM. INRAM, which is their Bible in terms of the information model and how you can orchestrate the various cellular uh, 5G networks. So now there is this new, um, I would say, um, update to the informational model to indicate the type of the attachment circuits that you can manage in. So, and then you can graph, I would say, the, uh, the 3GPP network to the transport network. Um, and then the, the arrow line, I would say, on, the, uh, on, on what we are providing attachment circuit as, as a service. Next slide, please. Uh, there's also the work which is done with the um, traffic engineering working group, mainly two documents there. The one about the, um, how you can map the, uh, the slicing that are provided by the um, 3GPP into the uh, IETF network slicing. So there's the, the work which is done by the, um, the, the first draft city there in the, in the slides. Uh, they are assessing uh, how the various attributes that can provide it directly from the 3GPP can be mapped to the one we have in the, um, in the, in the ITF side and they are mapping this to the, um, to the various models we have in the attachment circuits and also on, on the bearer data, 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 data nodes. Some of the, of the gaps have been, have been identified by all the authors of this draft, and the plan is that the, they will go back to the to GBP so that they can report those to them so that they can update also their, their informational model. And the second draft, which is also developed in the ETS working group, is, is related to the specification of the network slicing service. Um, so now, the, uh, since last IETF meeting, the, um, the um, modeling was modified so that you can point to attachment circuit as, as a, um, a reference to attachment circuit, uh, uh, which is defined by the, uh, the models we are proposing here in the PSA working group. Uh, so far, because we are not that, I would say, advanced in the process, this can be just references as a string. So for me, that's, it's not clean, but fine, we, because we don't want to, um, to have a strong dependency on what we are doing here and not slowing that work. So, I think that's, 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 a, that's a great progress we have on, on, on that side. And they, are, they also providing some explanation for the future extensions and documentation of the uh, slicing model, how you can reuse the various modeling we have on the attachment circuit as a service and also the attachment circuit um, uh, in the uh, camel model itself. Next slide, please. So basically, we have the scope of the, um, this, this work, which is getting more and more stable. The content is, is, is really stable because we are using on various pieces that we have produced here in the uh, OPSAR working group, the LTRNM, LTRNM, the, and also the, the SAP. Uh, this effort is being leveraged in various SDUs and also within the ATF. So this is really great that we have, I would say, a positive co co uh, collaboration between the various teams. Uh, so that's what, why we think that we are currently ready to go for, I would say, to ask for a working group option for this set of those, doc those, those doc documents. And that's Anne's my presentation. Uh, thanks, Matt. On the uh, ORAN uh, liaison statement, I saw it. I did not see that um, uh, we needed a reply or a reply was made, but we'll check with that, make sure that we're not... I, I think it, it, it was for information, if I'm not mistaken, but it's just a, a court I don't know if the... You are used in OPSA working up to, uh, to reply to that. Yeah, we receive that. Thanks to you. We have this information mm -hmm. yep. or yeah, this kind of uh, say, uh, reaction that I, I had in mind. Comments? Want to do a quick poll since we have a minute on whether or not to adopt? I think he's got it like ready to go. Raise your hand if you've read this, feel that it's uh, worth ad adopting, want to work on this. And if you uh, do not uh, feel it's worth adopting, do not raise your hand. If you haven't read it, you can abstain, obviously. Looks like things have slowed still, 17 to only one. Uh, well, a raised hand is going up. Uh, so yeah, we'll take this as well to the list for a formal um, check for adoption. Um, I realized that the slide timing was off compared to what the agenda is. So we aren't exactly where we should be time-wise, but uh, thanks to Med, we got a few minutes back. So I think we'll still be okay.
circuits incident management and good afternoon uh, good afternoon everyone my name is Qingwu. Uh, i will present the incident management for network service on uh, all the other uh, behalf uh, so this current version is a uh, zero one actually uh, we haven't get a chance to present in this working group last time actually but uh, we do actually present in uh, CCAM, net, uh, NetConf, NetMode, and got a good uh, positive uh, feedback. And also in this uh, zero one version, actually we just these comments. And uh, next. So why we want to, you know, uh, do this work? So motivation, actually, I think, uh, you know, uh, the most important, you know, for this uh, monitoring, actually, sometimes it's not uh, sufficient to, you know, identify data, uh, uh, relationship actually so sometimes uh, it's very uh, uh, challenging to assess the impact of the like uh, alarm and the metric when you do the troubleshooting uh, on the service and uh, one of the example is uh, you may actually uh, you know connect uh, some uh, KPI they affect service but there's no troubleshooting tickets uh, to be uh, triggered actually some other cases uh, you know the managing system has some challenges you know you know the uh, you may actually has already be overwhelming by you know frequency and quantity of this uh, alarm KPI and trace information actually. So may you, you may consider actually use some data uh, compression technology, but sometimes it's very uh, time consuming, labor in, in intensive actually. They, they may lead to the, this low uh, processing uh, efficiency. In some other cases actually, you may actually generate some duplicate uh, tickets. And that's because you may you know not aggregate uh, very well for these uh, different uh, and uh, uh, type of uh, you know from uh, data format of data actually sometimes you need to rely on some you know field uh, engineering maintenance engineering and uh, to uh, do the troubleshooting uh, this cause you know in, in calculate, uh, inaccurate root cause application also we see actually uh, though the current management system you know they actually when they connect uh, you know different uh, Whereas uh, a different uh, type of the data, like performance data, photo data, and the trace information data from various different uh, data sources, actually, they usually uh, build as a silo, cannot provide a consistent representation or reporting. So some cases, actually, when you investigate some of the faults, actually, you also need to, uh, you know, depend on some like, like topology data or performance data to really to find, you know, the faults, you know. Uh, so uh, next. So, what is the incident actually? So this is our understanding. So uh, you, uh, in, in the troubleshooting, you have, you know, alarm, you have a KPI, that's uh, uh, maybe not a C as an incident, but uh, if uh, this alarm and the KPI actually really affect service and make call service, you know, shut, inter uh, interrupt, or maybe cause some degradation of the service. So we will see this, uh, you know, trigger some events. So we, you know, we'll generate some uh, incident. So. You can see the relationship between the incident and the metric and the alarm. Actually, we can aggregate all these alarm or performance metrics into the incident. So uh, depending on whether they meet a specific threshold or, or some kind of criteria, for example, it, it really you know, affects the service. So we are, you know, generate this kind of incident. So this service really, uh, or this incident really used in the interface uh, between the you know, OSS and the domain controller. So, uh, it is a, a, a network level uh, events. Uh, next. So what do we uh, propose to do? Actually, uh, this is uh, this, what our solution looks like. Actually, uh, we really want to propose. You know, uh, you know, you can uh, get a, a different type of data source. Uh, actually, you can provide consistent. You know, managing all these uh, data sources and. Uh, so there's some relevant work in the TMF actually, they, uh, you know, define the information model, try to, you know, uh, uh, provide the incident management, uh, you know, API profile actually. These uh, uh, actually align with this kind of work, I try to use the young data model to uh, model these kind of, you know, incident profile data. Uh, and in addition, actually, we really can use these kind of incident to correlate topology data with, uh, you know, like alarm and a KPI. And uh, so, uh, in our model design, we use a little reference to really to point to a specific uh, node or hardware component in the network topology models. And also, we can identify the uh, relationship between the service and the incident. So, uh, 
either these uh, uh, relationships can be pre-configured, such as in the service assurance model, we actually already you know define the relationship between the cyber service and and simpleton. Actually, we can derive this kind of incident from it. And then in addition, actually, we can use some kind of you know service impact analysis, and maybe use some AI to you know identify the relationship between the incident and the network service. So we can use this kind of you know uh, uh, troubleshooting API. We define it here actually between the uh, domain controller and OSS really provide a uh, you know closed loop li life cycle management. Next. So how to identify the incident? So as we mentioned, actually this uh, uh, incident can be identified either based on the alarm data or based on uh, KPI data or compilation of these kind of different uh, data. For example, for some kind of alarm data, you may actually uh, uh, receive some kind of you know interface down or RGP down. Actually, this may affect the service, so we uh, you know will you know generate this uh, uh, incident. So uh, other cases actually like uh, you know KPI like uh, uh, you know packet loss or delay did, uh, really you know, impact the user experience. And uh, so this will you know, generate the incident. So in some other cases, uh, we can use some uh, AI impact, uh, uh, service impact analysis to uh, you know, uh, detect this kind of incident. If we, uh, we find some event, really, uh, some kind of alarm or uh, really affect uh, the, the service. So we are you know, uh, based on this actually to uh, establish the mapping between the service and the incident. Next. Uh, we also, you know, in the job, actually, we clarify the uh, relationship with the uh, alarm management. This is some work already be published in the CCAM working group. And I, we think, uh, you know, this incident management can work together with alarm management. So uh, you can see, actually, uh, incident management system really can receive this alarm data from the incident management system. And so use this to suppress, you know, some of the, you know, uh, duplicate alarms. And uh, also we can, you know, aggregate this alarm uh, together with some, you know, metrics data, trace data, to generate the incident. So, in in addition, actually, incident can, you know, uh, establish a relationship with the service in the instance. So, one in, uh, instance uh, can, you know, really link to the multiple service, uh, in, uh, service instance. Next. Uh, so this is uh, what you know incident data model design look like. Like you can see, actually, this uh, really we model the relationship between the incident and the service. And, and also we can correlate the, the incident with uh, uh, specific topology data, like uh, you know, uh, uh, network node and uh, uh, hardware component, and uh, maybe uh, some of, uh, other source actually, we also can correlate with uh, events actually. So in addition, actually we can you know, provide the incident notification when the you know, incident get generated and also can provide uh, some IPC to provide closed loop uh, management. Yeah, that's the whole uh, our design. And for detail, we can read in the, the job. Uh, next. Do you want to take a question from Alex or you want to yeah, keep sure. going? Yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah, I almost uh, out of the end. Okay. Yeah. Okay, sure. Yeah, uh, Alex Lem. Uh, I have a question actually in terms of how, why you think actually this fits into here, the Ops AWG and IETF, because for me, incident management is something that would happen at the OSS level. So really, basically, it's more IT, ITIL or uh, TMF and so forth, uh, that, that type of problem. Can you perhaps comment on that? Yeah, can you uh, move back to the last slide? Actually, I do have some uh, backup slide in the appendix. Oh, wow. next, 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 next. At the end. Yes, this one. So TMF really, you know, you know they work on, you know, OSS. Actually, the, this uh, TMF uh, API uh, actually use you know, on top of the OSS. So for us, actually, we define network level, you know, incident management use between the uh, domain controller and OSS. So this uh, really can help OSS to you know uh, reduce you know duplicate uh, 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 troubleshooting tickets. And uh, so uh, OSS actually uh, you know can be you know uh, relieved with the, the challenge. You know you uh, because you uh, you be be well overwhelming, but with you know various different you know alarm or uh, KPI data. So, uh, so you may depend uh, depend on the this domain controller actually to help you know uh, provide the closed loop actually really can help to reduce these troubleshooting things. So they, you know, uh, align with what MEF is uh, TMF is doing and uh, can work together. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Daniele Ceccarelli. So you keep on speaking about. Uh, 
the interface between the controller and the OSS. But what happens if you have a hierarchy of controllers? Is this applicable also between a, like a domain controller and an hierarchical controller or not? Yeah, that's a good question. We, we just try to give this example, not a limit to that. There are some cases we have some, you know, uh, multi-level, you know, higher level controller. So I, I think uh, uh, we, we, one of the feedback we receive from CCAM is uh, this kind of incident management can really work with like a multi-layer uh, uh, management work in the CCAM. So we hope actually we will, you know, investigate these kind of use cases, see how this incident management can, you know, reuse the in, in, in the CCAM, uh, you know, future work. Yeah. Okay. Thank and uh, thank you, Gargi and Laurent, for uh, joining. But uh, can we take this to the list? Because we are running okay. out of time. Thank, thank you. you. Um, I see you there, Jean. Hello. Hi, Jean. Uh, data manifests. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to present the status on the uh, data manifest draft. So next slide, please. So the goal of this draft is to be able to understand uh, the result, the, the collected data after it has been collected. And for instance, if it's stored in a, in a database to be able to interpret it correctly. Uh, so basically, uh, the analyst could uh, go and get the data and with the data get the information of how it was uh, collected and uh, where it comes from and so on. Uh, next slide, please. So the, to, to express a little bit uh, more clearly what we mean is if we have, for instance, we, re we see that we have a counter that is value 42 or a status that is up and then we don't receive anything? Is it because there was a problem with the telemetry? Is it because the period is really long? Is it because it's actually uh, unchanged telemetry? Is it because there was a bug on the device? We want to be able to retrieve that from the, from the data manifest. So next slide, please. Our proposition is to have two young modules. So the platform manifest, which is basically about the uh, characterizing the device that produces the data. So it includes uh, the vendor, um, the OS version, and things like that, and the set of uh, young modules that are available on the device. And then we have the data collection, which is more specific um, to the collection itself, uh, including the information about whether it is on change, what is the uh, actual period, uh, if it's uh, not on change, at which the data was collected, and so on. And the idea is that we define this uh, module, um, this model that is uh, stored along the data, along with the data uh, when it's uh, when the data is collected, and that is kept uh, when the data is transformed or uh, moved to a different place, so that the the people that are getting that uh, data in the end are able to understand uh, why some points are missing or the values uh, that they see in the in the database next slide please so the changes since the last uh, presentation so the draft has been adopted by the working group um, not more change not much change on this draft itself there is the draft that uh, Diego will present just after which is about uh, ensuring the integrity of the of the data manifest. So this is the main notable change, let's say, in the uh, in the draft. And uh, also, we have closed some of the open questions that we had, such as the uh, the issue of having uh, multiple virtual devices uh, on the same platform. Well, we have introduced this platform ID, which would allow to distinguish between the different virtual devices on that platform. Uh, next slide, please. So I want to spend a little bit more time on uh, an issue that is maybe not for this working group, but this is a real issue that we that we have with this draft at the moment, is that we want to reuse modules that have been defined for devices in a network level. 
so why do we want to do that? Basically, we want to have the young library, uh, which contain the information about the young modules and the subscribe notification module, which contain the information about uh, the status of the of the collection, or at least the parameters of the uh, of the telemetry subscription. And uh, these modules have been designed to be device modules. And what we want to know is to add an index, which is the platform ID, and have the uh, under this index, uh, this key actually to be uh, to use the, the right language, uh, under this key to have the information about the young library for that platform ID and the, sub the notification, uh, the subscriptions for that platform ID. And when we try to do that in practice, uh, we have some issues uh, to actually write the Yang module. So <clears throat> for instance, uh, the augments, um, there is this uh, Young Library revision, which enables to have um, the, 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 the Young revisions uh, in, uh, in the Young Library. And it's augmenting the path of the original Young Library. But now we are reusing the grouping. So the path is changing. And when this happens, it, it means that we actually we have to, uh, we can reuse the grouping from Young Library, but we have to rewrite the augments. And it's not a very nice solution since basically the uh, it's, it's like uh, copy pasting almost the entire content of an existing uh, of an existing uh, uh, draft, uh, young module, sorry. And uh, we have also some issue with uh, young push and uh, ITF subscribe notification because there are some nodes that have the same name uh, in, uh, in, in the grouping that we can reuse. And uh, for young push, uh, it is okay because young push is augmenting um, the ITF subscribe notification, so they don't have the same namespace. But since in our case, we are reusing the groupings uh, of both uh, modules, uh, we, we are actually, uh, the grouping are actually inheriting the namespace of um, the modules that cause the uses uh, directive. And so now the, this, this names, these two leaves that have the same name, they are in the same level, so it's not, uh, it's not correct. So what, what, what we had to do to make the, the young actually compile is to write a different version of uh, the young push with a different name. So next slide, please. Uh, so actually, all I just said was uh, already said, maybe better in the intro of the RFC 8528 uh, about the, this kind of difficulties with, uh, uh, with young. And uh, they propose they identified three use cases for uh, mounting modules into inside modules, which is what we want to do. We want to reuse the device level modules uh, inside network level modules. And what we want is actually to have always the same implementation for every uh, parent module. In, in that case, the parent module is the data manifest, and we want to have the same data manifest on every device. So our, our use case is not covered by the RFC uh, 8528. Uh, next slide, please. So the, let's say, very quick draft ID that, uh, that we propose uh, is to actually uh, define the new extension that we would call the static mount. Um, and this uh, extension will actually take the prefix of modules that are imported. So the modules are known at design time because you import them uh, when you compile the, the, the module. And uh, basically, all the static mount together would create a new independent context uh, for that um, uh, in, in that container. So here it's a list actually. So here for each platform, we would have, for instance, the young library and the augmentation, uh, which means that we would actually have uh, directly the, the schema of the young library available for each platform. And we don't need to rewrite the augments. We can directly reuse the modules that are uh, already existing. Uh, and we don't need to change the namespace and so on. And since we are, um, basically the idea is that here, when we mount, we would keep 
the namespace of the of the existing module, so we, we don't have to uh, take care of the of the grouping that defines the, the sampling. Uh, so next slide, please. So basically, the big question is: Should we start uh, on the static young moon draft, uh, or is is there uh, something that uh, we didn't think about that would help us in that case? And uh, I think another question is uh, maybe uh, more uh, high level: Are we missing any data we compared to what we currently have in the draft? Okay. Any questions? Victor Lopez uh, from Nokia. Uh, we have been looking at the, a similar problem when you want to reuse the models to configure the network. And uh, I would like to be interested, I'm interested to, to work on this uh, static jump mount uh, solution or something similar. We are having a similar issue for not to retrieve the data, but also to use it to configure the, the network. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks, John. Uh, we are running short on time, so I would ask people to go to the list. I'd also say if you contacted NetMod, or maybe I'd just say it might be worth discussing this with NetMod uh, and leave it at that. Um, uh, but thank you. Thank you. Jose. Okay, so this is uh, about uh, new, as uh, Jan was mentioning, it's, uh, it's a new draft that is uh, originated uh, from the, some discussions inside the, uh, the metadata um, draft about uh, wanting uh, provenance and how to, to, to do this uh, while using uh, compact signatures. So the idea is to, to provide provenance of the data. Um, basically, well, uh, data provenance is the way in which uh, it's possible to uh, prove the, um, the origin of a piece of data and even which uh, have been the uh, different places for where it has passed until it's being, uh, it's being uh, used. And the idea is, uh, is to, to guarantee that a, a set, or a, a, a young data set, can be reused in different um, in different scenarios. This was motivated because we were discussing when uh, making these uh, metadata statements. We were we identified that would be desirable to be able to to follow what was uh, uh, the the um, how the data has been uh, moved from uh, from one place to another, and is basically useful. Basically, can be used in other cases whenever the data set is is uh, used beyond or outside of the original online flow, the, the, the original connection. Typical thing is, uh, well, well, whenever we're using data intermediaries uh, for whatever uh, training or reuse of the uh, of the data offline for training uh, 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 machine learning or, or validating a particular behavior. And uh, well, another possibility that uh, we have been considering is, uh, is the possibility of, uh, of uh, providing mechanisms for, for running other trades. Can you move on? So the, uh, uh, the, the foundations and basically is that uh, currently, whenever you want or we want to establish trust, certain degree of trust on the, uh, <clears throat> on the, on the origin and integrity of a, of a jam data set is based on, on, on the crypto material. We're using TLS, we're using SSH, we're using whatever encapsulates the connection and the transport. And there are a set of identity and crypto material that ha can be used to establish this trust of the, uh, on the, of the, and the provenance. Which is something that becomes contentious if it uh, is, is used offline for sure, because somebody can manipulate whatever, and the only thing that you have is that well, when it was con uh, connected to, to this site, the uh, the data was this, but this is something that you have to believe and cannot verify. And the idea is that uh, with, with this proposal, what we're trying is to put the uh, the trust inside the data. I mean the the trust, the means for verifying the, the, the provenance inside the data itself. So we can avoid the, the need for transitive trust. I have to trust you because I, I mean, I have to trust the data because I trust you and I trust you that you have not modified what you received from the original part. 
the proposal is intended to have a extremely low impact in any model that decides to, to use it. And uh, the idea is to use, uh, uh, to support recursion currently. Uh, th this is something that we are, uh, well, uh, we, we are thinking how to, uh, what would be the best way of supporting this recursion. That means that you can aggregate data. I mean, when talking about recursion, what we're talking is about when you have a, an aggregate data set that has different components, how you can establish trust on the aggregate data set and trust the aggregator and individually uh, put trust on the, uh, on the provenance of the uh, pieces that are part of the aggregate data set. And uh, for these ideas to uh, be based on, on, on COSI, COSI is, uh, is a, the CBOR based uh, signaling and, and encryption which is quite concise and, and has an extremely interesting property that is the possibility of having a detached payload. What means is that we can avoid to have an envelope that wraps the whole data set and we can use the, the data set as, a, as part of, a, of, a, of the detached data that is going to be used. Can you move on? So for this, what we are proposing is to have uh, uh, adding a leaf element that contains a cozy signature. One and only one, uh, and only once in the, in the enclosing elements. So, and this would be the signature for the whole element in which this element appears. That can be put um, 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 put as a, as a, in the schema as a, in the model as a, um, as a leaf anywhere. And we propose a, a type def that is, uh, is on the draft, basically saying that it's a, bina a binary uh, string, as uh, is in the case of uh, anything that is producing COSI. And this, what you have here, is an example that is associated with the platform manifest that uh, Jean was uh, mentioning before. Can you move on? The signatures. The signature is, uh, is a, uh, a, 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 one, a single signature using, using COSI. Is a, it holds only one signature associated with the, with the data. And well, this, those are the parameters that we are proposing. Basically, it's the uh, algorithm identifier, the set, serialization method, method, and we are proposing to support XML, JSON, and, and CBOR. The parameters regarding the, algor the algorithms and the two important things here are the, on the one hand, the key ID, which is how you identify the key that was used for signed for, for, for signing, and that allows the, uh, a verifier to uh, verify the signature and how the signature is, uh, is, um, is generated is by taking the enclosing, the enclosing JAN element, taking off the signature itself, the element of the, of the signature itself, and taking this as the, as the external data to be used for the COSI signing proce uh, procedure. So after applying the, uh, the, uh, the applicable canonicalization method that you have to apply for any digital signature. The, and the, uh, the uh, canonicalization, can canonicalization method, depending on the, uh, on the serialization, is, is uh, described in the, uh, in the draft. Can you move? So with this, uh, this is uh, what is proposed. We have made uh, an initial feasible, uh, feasibility assessment to see that this is possible and that we generate something that looks like a signature and that can be verified. For sure, we, we have to refine and detail use, use cases a little bit beyond what is, uh, what is the original one regarding the metadata, et cetera. Any idea that you may have about uh, when and where the provenance, the provenance of certain data um, is uh, desirable, it would be welcome. We need to, to experiment beyond the uh, initial feasibility evaluation and end up with something that is, well, sort of close to a, to a reference implementation. That would maybe identify some uh, more additional issues uh, regarding uh, serialization and COSI itself, how we identify the key IDs, and because for now it's left as a, as a local process for the, uh, the, the uh, signer and the, and the verifier and uh, well and try to build a reference implementation on this. We uh, still need to think about how uh, implement uh, fully uh, uh, achieve recursion, whether we can use just Jan nesting that would be the, the, the straightforward solution 
or consider cozy with uh, multiple signatures that is as well possible and that would open the door for things like endorsements or uh, and, and, and similar uh, constructs and addressing the uh, the uh, data pipelining concepts and how we will or we could include these uh, uh, these uh, mechanisms as part of the uh, of that pipeline well for sure whatever idea comments or that you have and i think i'm finished Rob. So short of time, so I'll try and be quick. So I think this is a really interesting problem. The idea of sort of trying to annotate information about where the problems where data is coming from and, and carry it through the data pipeline. Um, I sort of wonder in my own head, how do you do that with in some cases you, you're popular, uh, pushing sort of individual ease and other times you're pushing much bigger chunks of data and how you sort of track it. Do you track them in the individual leaf basis or something bigger? Um, so I think that's interesting. And then the other thought on this is, have you looked at the like Yang metadata uh, way of sort of annotating extra information into the data that's already flowing? But I may misunderstand what you're doing. Mm, well, the, the, the idea is that it's a, it's a, it was not to, to, to avoid that annotation and that to make it on the, uh, on the data itself, as part of the data itself. And, and this is, has to deal, I mean, I should be able to deal with whatever the size of data. Whether this could be part of an annotation, <laughs> this is something that I, I, Jolome, I will take note and, and will think think about it uh, because I mean that could help as well in in uh, supporting this uh, recursion idea. So that's that's a that's a good point. Thank you, Jean. Uh, please be quick. Yeah, uh, just about where to put it. I think the so the young push header, the notification header, would be a right place because it would mean we could have. Uh, signed telemetry, basically. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah. that's uh, something that's... Uh... Balash? Balash, then, yeah. Did you think about using this in combination with the Yang instance data file format? Because I think that could benefit from this, and it's already defining an envelope for Yang data. For, for signing, I mean? For sending or even for offline storage. Mm. Uh, frankly, not, and, and then something that uh, again the, the original the the, uh, the original goal of this was dealing with the metadata itself, and it was we were focusing on the metadata, and then the idea of generalizing this is something that came afterwards. So once we have the proposal on on the on the table, so I I, I will I will check the different choices, and, and for sure we will talk about this in a, in uh, on the list or whatever. Yes, Very thank good. you. Okay. Randy, you with us? Yes, but you're not allowing me to run the clicker yet. And I think there I just go. granted it to you. Yeah, yeah. Okay, RFC 9092 describes geofeed, find a fine geofeed data. And this is an update to them. Um, quick agenda. Geofeed on one slide, what the changes are, ITF process, and open for questions. Essentially, geofeed data registries have, that registries like the RIRs have objects called INET num objects, which can contain pointers to geofeed URLs, which point to files, which can be very specific about where that those IP addresses are. We suggest they not be too specific due to privacy issues, of course. The significant changes are separate imp implementation status section. RIPE has implemented the attribute as you have seen in the uh, above slide. Databases which do not support the geofeed attributes itself use comment sections known as remarks. So it, it, there's a fully functional open source implementation by Massimo, which gathers from all the RIRs in a batch FTP fashion, sucks it up and produces a single file for processors of geofeed data who want it. We discourage INET nums that have both the remarks attribute and the geofeed attribute. 
but we don't outlaw it. We stress that the authentication, GeoFeed attributes, uh, date files can be cryptographically signed. We suggest that this is not mandatory. IP address extensions should not use the inherit facility because it complicates things greatly. Essentially, you have to be at the end entity. You have to go all the way up to the trust anchor, all the way back down, remembering what you're doing. It's a lot of work and doesn't really gain you anything. If geofeed data are present, ignore other hints like geographic data in other records. <clears throat> 8805 wanted to future proof allowing blah, 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 blah. Let's leave that for the next round. Geofeed files must be UTF-8 based CSVs. There are over, currently over 100,000 prefixes with Geofeed data in operation. And eight of the well-known geolocation providers are importing these data i.e. this thing is deployed and working. And questions, we have a minute and a half. I think Good Warren on. is coming to the mic. Uh-oh, it's the Warren attack. Go for it, Ace. Sort of adding to that, if part of the reason that geolocation kind of works for the IETF meeting network now is because we publish these. And that's why, you know, it knows that you're here and not in Yokohama. So the original work was done here. This uh, uh, is a bis to that. Uh, I think, I don't believe we've adopted it yet, but I think the next step would be to see what the working group wants to do. And I think adopting as a contributor, not as a chair, I think adopting it is the is a good thing. I would support that. No other comments? Thank, Thank you, Randy. You. This will be our last presentation. Apologies to Luis and Marisol. Um, we just ran out of time. Uh, we will uh, prioritize you, and we'll note it in the, uh, in the minutes. We'll prioritize you for um, uh, 118. So, Alex. <laughs> Yeah, so this uh, is an update on the green networking metrics draft. Next slide, please. Give me one sec. So, um, yeah, so uh, essentially this is, although the, it's, a, it's a zero, zero revision now, it's really a zero, three. It supersedes an earlier draft and we reflected uh, the upside WG name in the uh, well, uh, working group in the, in the name of this. Uh, again, the purpose of this is to to provide a set of metrics for sustainable networking, basically visibility and, and instrumentation has been recognized as an important building block for sustainable networking solutions. There have been multiple uh, or many discussions on the e-impact mailing list. Uh, there was a site meeting uh, earlier um, this week and so forth. And so this basically um, plays into that, into that theme. Um, next one, please. So updates from the earlier revision is well, uh, for so, so we have uh, two new co-authors. Um, uh, we added a new section on green metrics that have been defined uh, elsewhere, so outside of IETF, uh, notably Etsy, which has done substantial work in that space. Um, the specific analysis of the existing inventory and which particular metrics to adopt is to be done. Uh, so we may adapt actually metrics from other source, uh, sources and cross reference as applicable um, as complementing the, the set is that, that is currently defined in the draft. And there's also a new section on controversies. Actually, most of the discussion is actually not on the OPSI WG mailing list, it's on the e-impact mailer. Um, and uh, so there were various topics such as metrics distortion, the ability to gain metrics, how to counteract that, benchmarking things, uh, distinguishing between metrics which are good versus bad versus useful. There was a big uh, Big fit concerning if kilowatt hours uh, over gigabyte uh, should be done and so forth. So basically, these these things are now captured in that in that uh, revision. We also made editorial updates and uh, refined the discussion throughout. 
uh, updated terminology, updated references, clear distinction between the primary metrics and then other metrics which are derived or based on those, uh, as well as actually most metrics now, or pretty much all metrics actually have particular usage examples as to why they are relevant. Um, next slide, please. And uh, in the interest of time, actually, it's, this, there are some recap slides. You'll find them in the minutes, but I think we can skip over them here. So again, these metrics are grouped into metrics that apply at the equipment and device level. Next one, please. Uh, at the flow level, um, basically aggregating uh, across the duration of flows, uh, across paths, and for the network at large. Next slide. Um, there are various other aspects which are uh, which are discussed uh, as well. Uh, aspects from uh, dealing with uh, basically extending the view, holistic view beyond the network itself, to aspects dealing with certification as well as dealing with imprecision and uncertainty. Next one, please. So uh, the next steps are actually uh, the the draft is actually I believe it is actually fairly maturing. Um, there are, there is of course work to be done. So uh, as I mentioned, most importantly, the refining of the analytics of metrics that are defined elsewhere and incorporating and cross-referencing aspects from, from Etsy. Uh, there are a few more editorial uh, updates that need to be done. And uh, really, however, it's still an individual draft. So we would also like uh, pose the question of working group adoption. And that's all on this stuff. Questions, comments? Time. Daniele. Hi again. Uh, so have you considered uh, that part of this work might fall uh, into the inventory work that we are starting tomorrow? Um, this defines, well, actually, I, I don't think this falls directly into that work. This defines metrics. It does not define the data models for the metrics yet. So I do think actually there is a potential tie-in for this because actually also as one of the related works is defined actually you, a next step would be to define potentially a gang data model for instance, which might fall into that, uh, into the network inventory work. So I do, I do think there's potential tie-in, but I don't think there's a dependency of this draft on that other work. Uh, Robleton. So just to say, I mean, you had a side meeting on um, green networking, things like mm -hmm. that. There's been a lot of discussion there as all the right places to put this sort of work into the ITF. Uh, one of the things that they're setting up is a site, um, set up an IB program that will mm -hmm. coordinate stuff, but that won't, that won't actually do work and produce work. I raised the question as to whether we need to have a, like an IoT ops type working group for, for green networking. I think mm -hmm. the answer to that was not at this time. So basically I'm saying is I think this is an okay home to do this sort of work related to this, if there's enough interest within this group. Uh, to answer the question about IV, I think potentially down the line, but IV is quite narrowly charted at the moment to focus on doing this core um, inventory YANG model. And I want the focus of that working to be on that work, at least in the initial point until that's sort of completed, then it can start looking at other stuff. Mm -hmm. I have a related chair hat question to what Rob just said. You, you mentioned one of your slides, a lot of the discussions happening on an, another mailer. If OPSOG was to adopt this, would the people that are interested in it want to work on it here? Well, hopefully. I mean, basically, they, they, they are aware of this. So basically, clearly, basically we, we, uh, they are aware that the work is on, in OPSOG WG. Uh, I'm not sure how many people have actually from e-impact have actually joined here. They do seem to be fairly disjoint sets actually. This is one of the uh, impedance mismatches that we have here. And I guess which also the, uh, the IEB program <laughs> asked the same question. And, but uh, again, this seems to be the best home or the most suitable home, but uh, I, I'm not quite sure how to address that issue. Clearly it would be valuable actually to bring some of that, uh -huh. uh, more of that discussion onto the mailer here. Um, yes, and just to add to that, I think that Alex has got this exactly right, that the folks that are interested, some of the folks that are interested in this green networking work are new to IETF, yeah. and so they'll need some guidance and help into how to participate, where to participate, that sort of thing, because I think at the moment um, it's a bit scattergun, some of the stuff has been mm -hmm. discussed. Well, I, I can say that if it, it is here, and if you want adoption here, and it sounds like our AD is, is supportive, participant hat, I find it interesting. I would say get them to start commenting on your work on the list so we mm -hmm. can say, look, we have the discussion. It's clearly something that, that's worth working on. Mm -hmm. 
All right. Thanks. Thank you. Is there so anything else? Uh, I think no. we can go to the next one. Next one. There was a next one. Yes. Oh, I had two in my slot. Uh oh. Uh, I still yeah, have three minutes. You still have three <laughs> That's minutes. Enough to do. Ah, <laughs> sorry. Things got messed up in in the. Uh, yeah, sorry. They got okay. messed up in the order. All right. You want me to go or Laurent ask uh, question? Actually, I had a comment on the ah. previous uh, discussion, but it's more like from a process point of view because. Currently, this green networking sustainability discussion is a bit, I, I mentioned, cross area. How do we manage? I mean, are we going to copy many different mailing lists? Do you have a recommendation how we should do that? Because th there may be multiple mailing lists, multiple groups. So we cannot say comment only on ops area for this draft because then excludes other comments or history. Just an idea. Yeah, and I think that's a clearly valid question, uh, Rob Altinger. I think it's a really valid question, and I think at the moment that was what the IB program started, was trying to coordinate across the ITF, like across area. And so if the stuff where it sort of fits okay in an ops home, that's the work that should happen here. And I think this is probably fine. I mean, you're getting operational telemetry off the device. I think that fits here, but it's not the wider discussion. It's not trying to bring all, the, all this discussion here. It's this specific piece of work. All right. Um, no. I'll make it real quick. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, so the next is a new draft concerning export of flow precision availability metrics using IP fix. Um, next slide, please. So basically, the background is there is actually work on precision availability metrics um, that is taking place in IPPM. Um, this is actually going now to working group uh, last call. Uh, this draft. The, the topic of this, or basically what this concerns, is to, uh, when you have services which are governed by service level objectives, for instance, high precision services, the type that are being defined in DeadNet or being enabled by DeadNet uh, and so forth, where you have, for instance, stringent latency guarantees and so forth. You want to basically know um, when the promised precision is available or whether when it has been not been available uh, or when it has been violated and so according in this other work basically the various metrics are being defined however what is not defined there is how to collect retrieve and export those metrics and this is basically one aspect that is being addressed here um, IP fix clearly allows to ex export flow records with statistics about flows. This applies directly actually here. So therefore, basically, this draft is about extending IP fix to, ex uh, to export uh, precision availability metric data. Next slide, please. So, uh, and accordingly, basically, the, the, the core of this is to, to define these new information elements. They are basically categorized into two, two sets, if you will. One thing basically is information elements to reflect precision availability metrics. These are things such as uh, violated intervals count, violation free, uh, violation free intervals count, and, and, and a few more. And the second category um, are information elements which provide the required context to be able to correctly interpret or that provide the necessary context to interpreting those records, such as, for instance, when we look at the violated intervals, what is the length of that uh, uh, interval? Also, what is the surface level objective? Clearly, this is basically violation. What is on is not a violation; is relative uh, to uh, to the to this particular notion. Uh, Alex, so, we're we're way over time. We're not going to. Sorry, Thomas. Okay. You'll have to okay. go to the list. We want right. to give we want to give the ops area uh, okay. their chance. Okay. All right. The next one is the last slide, I think. So. Yeah. All right. <laughs> I need to Well, while they're trying to find slides and things like that, um, there's two things I want to point out that's, that's useful. Um, number one, despite how much I love you all, I'm giving up in March. Um, and so, although it's been a fun ride uh, and fun, I would encourage anyone that's sort of considering um, standing for the ops management role to come and talk to me. Um, there's de definitely some really good positives about it. There's a lot of work to do there. You need good buy-in from your employers, but if you want to talk to me about what the role is like, uh, what, is it, what it actually involves, then I'm more welcome to talk to that. Talk about that. Uh, and the other thing I want to point out is there was a side meeting on digital map stuff happening earlier this week. Uh, we've now got um, a mailing list set up, digital map hyphen yang, uh, check with Ben Y if I've got it quite right. Um, and I said, I'm going to be a coordination place to see if there's people interested in this work and whether 
Uh, you can get some people, sort of a group of people together trying to sort of coordinate and then decide what to go forward uh, with that work. That's my side of stuff. Uh, what? Yeah, as Rob said, he's stepping down at the end of the thing. And so we need other people. And this is the open mic time. And you've only got 30 seconds. It's almost as though we planned it. <laughs> 28, 27, 26. Okay, I guess we'll call this done. Thank you very much, Upside WG Chairs, for running it and for getting the timing so good. <laughs> Thanks, all. Not on. Um, so, um, I'm going to pull up the rest of the chat.